And so today's message is the horse and the rider, the red horse. I want you to truly know that I believe, truthfully, that we are living in the end times as far as it pertains to when Jesus Christ will return for his church. I truly believe that. And I don't just say that on my own fruition. I don't just say that in my own opinion. I say that because if you look in the scripture, there is nothing left to be fulfilled before Jesus Christ raptures the church. Nothing. There's nothing else left. There are prophecies to be fulfilled before his second coming for Israel, but there is not anything left. Nothing. And so that's why I believe that. But with that, I want to say this. When we look at these end times, when we think about being in the last days, don't be afraid. And the reason I say that is because we have a God. We have a Savior. And so when you think about these last days, you think about all the things that maybe you've heard about what's going to happen. Maybe you've heard some things that were correct. Maybe you've heard some things that were not. Maybe you have a lot of different misconceptions or ideas or understandings about what you believe or, or what you don't. But here's the, the ground floor of this is that you don't go into it with fear, with fear. Many, many people that have come before us would desire and long to be living and sitting in the seats that we're sitting in today, to get to see Jesus Christ return for his church. I mean, the, the early church got, they, they were so excited about it, they stopped working. Do you know that? They literally stopped their jobs. They stopped working. And they were just sitting around waiting for Jesus Christ to return. And so that's where it comes out. And Paul says, hey, guys, listen, you got to work here. You know, you can't just sit here and just, you know, wait for this to happen. Okay? But they were so excited about that. And that was thousands of years ago. How much more us today? Don't be afraid. As we continue to look at the book of Revelation, I want to point out something to you that after chapter 3 in the book of Revelation, the church, we, do no, we no longer see mentioned in the events that are going on. Well, I wonder what happened, right? Why do we not see the church mentioned on the earth anymore? Because Jesus Christ has returned and taken us, all right? So I want to show you something. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 and 52. As we get into this this morning, Paul is speaking here and he says, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Notice the word all that he uses there, all. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, I want you to notice that Paul is not excluding. Now, he's talking to the believers at Corinth, the church at Corinth. So let's get that taken care of. He's not talking in general to every person in the entire world. He was talking, the letter is to the church at Corinth, the believers there. And he is saying to them, we shall all be changed. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. It says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain... Are you alive this morning? Amen. Shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, I want you to look at this idea, this word caught up. The word caught up here 
is the Greek word harpazo. And it means this. It means to seize, to snatch up, to catch up, to snatch away. And this is where the idea, the term of rapture comes from. From this idea of catching up, seizing up, snatching away, meeting Christ in the air. Now, a lot of times when we talk about the rapture of the church and we talk about the second coming, there's a lot of confusion about what's happening. The rapture and the second coming are two different events that take place. They're not the same event that takes place. They're two different events. The rapture happens before the time of great tribulation. As I said before, when you look at the church in the book of Revelation and where it's mentioned on earth and where it's not, and we look at the idea of the horses that are being released in chapter 6, we don't see the church present to receive the wrath that is coming on the earth. All right? The church will be raptured. Jesus Christ will not set foot on the earth during the rapture of the church. All right? But he will step foot in Jerusalem when he comes back for the second coming. There are two different things that we're talking about. All right? So I want you to be on the same page with me today. But it's still good for us to know about the events that are going to take place in the world. Even though we are going to be with the Lord, it's good for us to have an understanding. It's good for us to have hope. We should have hope today. Hey, if we are in Christ, we are not subject to the complete and utter destruction and turmoil that's going to be taking place. We are not going to be part of that. We will be with him. That should give us hope, everybody. Amen. It should also make you look at your unbelieving friends and relatives and loved ones and say, I don't want you to be a part of that. I don't want you to have to be here for that. So I want you to look at Revelation chapter 6 today. We're going to move there, starting in verse 3. And it says, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So we have last week our white horse that set out with a rider that had a crown and a bow, but no arrow. This week we have a red horse and a rider, but something has changed. Because the rider today has a great sword. So there's a little bit more, a lot more of a threat that is posed by what is happening with this rider. Remember last week, the white horse represented this false teaching, a false Christ, a false peace. But the red horse represents something different. It represents war, tremendous bloodletting. Unlike the rider of the white horse who posed a deceptive threat, the rider of the red horse has a great sword, and it's given to him for one purpose, destruction and war. So remember, during the first three and a half years of the tribulation, there will be this time, as I told you last week, of disguised peace. It's a perceived peace. But then all of a sudden, it will change. It will change. It will change. And all of that peace will be taken from the earth. When does this happen? When the red horse is released. And I thought about this. Why horses of all things, right? Have you thought about that? Jesus knows the beginning from the end. He knew we would have jet airplanes. Now, wouldn't you think today that a jet airplane, okay, we're going to release a jet with a pilot, right? Subsonic, supersonic speeds, right? 
Why a horse? Because horses represent this idea of swiftness. They're swift. They're swift. Okay? They come swiftly. They come surely. All right? And so you have this red horse that is released with its rider. And swiftly, peace is taken from the earth. Boom. Night and day. Look at what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.3. For when they shall say... Peace and safety. Then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Wow. Now I know we're getting it, it's sounding a little bit harsh today, but guys, listen. Sometimes we have to, to reveal the truth of God's word, all right? As I said last week, we have to be able to understand this. But listen, God, through his son, has made a way of escape for you. That's the hope. That's the hope. As Paul said, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. The events that are unfolding that I'm talking to you about, you have every opportunity to not be a part of them because of Jesus Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying? And he tarries and tarries and tarries. I believe he tarries and tarries and tarries because the Bible says he is not willing that any should perish. So it's not even that you have the opportunity. He is wanting you more than you're wanting him. He wants you to be saved more than you want to be saved. But when it happens, the Bible says they shall not escape. The red horse and its rider will bring a sudden, swift destruction. The full intentions of the Antichrist, the one who brought that deceptive idea of peace and united everybody. And as the Bible says, everybody says, peace and safety. Peace and safety. You're already starting to hear these themes in our world, right? Are you starting to hear those themes? Why are we doing these things? Why are we taking these precautions? Safety, right? And everybody's looking and they're saying, people are surrendering all of their rights and doing all this stuff. Why? Safety. It's safer. Now, we can argue both ways. Yes, it's safer for a school to have police officers and to have all the doors locked like Fort Knox, but at the same time, you no longer have just the ability or right to walk in there, right? So safety is something that we need to look at, and peace, peace, world peace. Now, I've said this before. There is no peace without the Prince of Peace, and right now, the world is underneath the Prince of Darkness, all right? So anything that happens, anything, any peace that goes on is either manufactured by man or is orchestrated deceptively by him. It doesn't matter what agreement you talk about. It doesn't matter what peace you talk. We signed this treaty. We signed that treaty. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. The full intentions will be revealed. He doesn't exist to bring peace. He exists to bring conflict and to conquer. And that's what will happen. Look at what Jesus says about this time in the book of Matthew, chapter 24. He says, For then shall be a time of great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor shall ever be. Now, I thought about this. Think about the things that have happened. Think about the flood, right? Even if we go back to the flood of Noah. Man, what a time of great tribulation. Eight people survived that. Like, that's a massive proportion of devastation. Eight people survived. And some animals, right? The whole rest of the world is wiped out. And Jesus says that this time is going to be unparalleled. Even compared to the flood, even compared to devastation that we've seen in different regions of the world, this time is unparalleled. 
since the beginning of the world to this time. But I like what he also says, nor shall ever be. Once this takes place, it's not going to happen again. There's no repeats. There's no gives these backsies. It's not, well, we got to reset the system again. No, no, no. This is it. This is it. Finale. Time's up. But Jesus tells us over and over and over, don't be afraid. Now, maybe you're like me and you think, Lord, how can you logically and reasonably ask me to not be afraid when I think about these things happening in the world? Here's why. Because he knows he will snatch us up. He knows that he's going to pull us out. He knows that he's going to catch us up, take us away. And that is the reason that we have that we can praise and worship to look up for our redemption draws nigh. How can I not be afraid? Because I know that he is going to take me out of this place because he promised to do so. But for today, what does this look like for us? We're not seeing we're not seeing these things happen. We're not seeing Gog and Magog come, you know, together in this massive battle and, and, and all of these things happening. We will see it, but we're not seeing it right now. What does this look like for us? It looks like this. It looks like strife. It looks like hardship. And it looks like trouble. It looks like trouble. The difference today is this. During that time of tribulation, the believers are no longer present. There will be people that are saved during the millennial rule of Christ. The Bible says that they'll, they'll pay for it with their life. They'll give their life, right? But I'm talking about what this looks like today. Here's the difference, all right? Today, we hold the great sword. We hold it. We hold it. What do you mean, Pastor? We hold the great sword. What is it? The sword of the Spirit. The Word of God. Look at what it says in Hebrews 4, chapter 12, or chapter 4, verse 12. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, who possesses that? You and I. We possess it. We possess it. The Word of God. We possess it. The Spirit of God. The sword of the Spirit. We possess it. And it's faster than anything. It says it's quick and it's powerful. Faster than Google, everybody. It pierces between the soul and the spirit. And this is important because the devil, what he wants to do is he wants to bring warfare into your mind. He wants to bring it into your mind. And here's what happens. When he brings warfare into your mind, it causes conflict between your spirit and your body and your mind and your spirit and your mind have a conflict against each other and your body manifests it. Your body manifests the conflict that's happening on the inside. This is why the Bible says that it goes on to the joints and the marrow because the warfare often causes problems in our body. But the Bible, the Word of God can divide the joints, and the marrow. What else can do that? What else can do that? Today we have bone marrow transplants, right? And they use lasers and laser precision. If you think about the Word of God, it's like a laser. It's that precise that it can divide. Look what 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 through 5 says. It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. 
Now, I want you to see this. It says that our weapons are not carnal, but they're mighty. What does that tell you about the weapons that are carnal? They're weak, right? They're not mighty. They're weak. Have you ever noticed that? They're not carnal, but they're mighty. So what is that saying? The carnal things that you use as a weapon, it's weak compared to the, what, what God has given us. You've heard people say this before, don't approach and tackle spiritual problems with natural solutions, right? That's not how you do that. It's weak to it. Why not use something that's powerful to the pulling down of strongholds? The word here, imaginations, it means this. It means a thinking, a conception, a reasoning, or a device. Now think about what we're looking at in our world today. Are we looking at a more progressive way of thinking, reasoning? Are we looking at any devices today of the enemy? It's only through the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God that these things can be pulled down. Pulled down. It doesn't... It, it, I've seen people doing things, and, and it's, it's admirable. They go into school board meetings, and they're taking literature that the school board has in libraries for their kids to read, and they're reading that literature out loud and, and to the whole school board. Have you seen those things happening? And I'm telling you, the stuff they're reading, it's like, whoa, why are our kids accessing this in school? I've seen the board members shut down the meeting because what's being read is so X-rated that they can't have it going on at the meeting. But listen, they're trying to tackle a spiritual problem with a natural solution. And God says our weapons are not carnal in nature. You're not going to defy this with your own logic and with your own knowledge. You have to use the spirit of God and the word of God that is powerful to pull down the stronghold that's there. The books that are in the library are not the stronghold that's there. They're just a fruit of what's happening. Do you understand what I'm saying this morning? The light of the word exposes the darkness. The truth will expose the lie. And most of the warfare that we face today is in our mind. Our mind wants to be in control. My mind wants to be in control. Let's say it that way. Maybe you're in the same place. Our mind wants to be king. And when you've not received Christ, your mind is king. It rules, for your spirit has not yet been made alive in him. So your mind is like when you haven't received Christ, even after you have, your mind is like that bachelor who gets married after living for years and years and years alone. He still wants to rule the roost, even though a new ruler has moved in. I didn't get any amens there, but, but truthfully, your mind wants to be in charge. And this is not how you were designed to live. It's not how I was designed to live. We are a spirit. We have a soul, our mind our emotions, and our will, and we live in a body. Our spirit was designed to be in control, and our mind and our body were designed to be in subjection to the spirit. When the spirit is in control, your mind subjects and your body subjects, and everything falls into line the way that it was created. But your mind doesn't just turn over and surrender. It doesn't. It would be great if it would, but then we wouldn't have to be told, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It doesn't just want to lay down and give up. It wants to be in charge. Look what it says as we read this passage. Bringing every thought, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Many Christians today are held captive 
by their thoughts because they're not enforcing their spiritual right to hold their thoughts captive. Hey, if you don't hold your thoughts captive, they will hold you captive. That's what the Bible is saying here, right? Like, it's giving you this, again, this option. Holding every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. If you don't do that, your thoughts will very much hold you captive. And guess what happens when your thoughts hold you captive? Worry, fear, anxiety. Right? That's where it leads to. And worry, fear, and anxiety lead to sickness and disease and stress and hurt and pain. And we can look at all the studies that, that show that. When your body is under severe stress and worry and anxiety, guess what? It causes symptoms. So how do I do this then? How do I hold my thoughts captive? You hold them captive to his obedience. When your thought says, you are a filthy sinner, you say this, Christ's blood was shed for my sins. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now, if you've not given your heart to Christ, you can't, you can't say that exactly. You have an opportunity to. But for those of you who have given your heart to Christ, when your thoughts start to say, how can you think that? Come on, some of you have been there. How can you think that? How can you even imagine that? Listen, casting down imaginations. Casting them down. That means they're going to be there. Now, the biggest thing that I found in my life is that the devil wants me to believe that I put them there. Now, what I do with what is there is on me. But there are times he puts things into your mind to distract you, to cause you to fail. Have any of you ever been standing on a, like a ledge, looking down, way down, and you have this thought in your mind, jump? That's not logical. Please, if you're there, please, that's not logical. But you have that thought. What is that? Now, you have a choice, right, of whether or not you're going to jump off of that or not. But why would you even think that thought? That's what I'm saying. This is where we get to. The devil puts these thoughts and then he says, how can you stand there and lift your hands and worship the Lord while you're thinking about that? And that's when you have to hold the thought captive to his obedience. It's not on your obedience. Because if it's on your obedience, I guarantee you 100%, the devil will immediately find the, the most recent failure that you just had, and he'll say, what about that? What about that? What about that failure? Holding the thoughts captive. When your thoughts say this, you're afraid of this, you have anxiety, you can't handle this situation. You have anxiety, you can't handle this. How do you respond to that? You say, I have not been given a spirit of fear. I can do all things through Christ. He redeemed me from the curse of worry and anxiety. Did you know Jesus Christ, when he prayed in the garden, and the Bible says that he sweat blood. His blood mixed with his sweat. In that moment, because the Bible says that the blood of Jesus redeems us from the curse. In that moment, that worry, that stress, that anxiety on his brow, guess what? The blood cleansed it, cleansed it, and fell from his brow, and dripped, and fell, and he sweat blood, and the anxiety that he had, and all of the, what was going through him as his capillaries burst in his head. You talk about anxiety, and worry, and fear. I've been stressed. I've been worried. I've never been so intensely stressed that the capillaries start busting in my head. But Jesus Christ did, and was, so that you can be redeemed from it.
He redeemed us from stress and anxiety. Don't take back what Jesus Christ has taken from you. Don't take back what he's taken from you. If he says, by his, by his stripes, as Peter said, you're healed, don't take that back. If he says, I've redeemed you from this curse, don't take that back. I've forgiven you for this. Don't take that back. A lot of times the battle that happens in our mind is because we are playing things over and over in our head that Jesus Christ, the Bible says that your sins and lawless deeds, I remember no more. So this is what that conversation's like. God, I'm sure I'm, I, I, I'm really, really sorry that like 20 years ago I did this. And God says, I don't, what are you talking about? Right? Your sins and lawless deeds, I remember no more. What are you talking about, Aaron? You're still, what, what are you even talking? I thought we were past that. Too often, we allow the devil to take from us what Christ gave us, and we don't keep what Christ gave us. It's like we hold on. It's like we allow him to just keep putting stuff on us. Here, okay, well, Jesus has given you this redemption, and I'm just going to take it from you and make you feel like you don't have it. But then at the same time, we're like, oh, yeah, well, the devil's putting this on me. Listen, it's in here. It's in your mind. When your thoughts say this, you'll never have enough. You look and you say, Jesus Christ took my poverty. He took my poverty. In him, I'll always have enough. He's, your thoughts might say, you're too far gone. You're too far gone. You're beyond saving. You've messed up too bad. You say, the grace of God is sufficient for me. I'm not who I was. I'm a new creation. The Bible says I'm a new creation. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. My sin, past, present, future was born in the body of Jesus Christ. And when he cried finished, he meant it. See, the battle's in here. It's in here. It's settled in the spirit. It's settled. The accounts are settled in the spirit. The battle's up here. Pastor, you mean Jesus died for my future sins? Hey, every sin that you've committed and that I've committed were future sins when Jesus died. Every one of them, right? We had not yet committed them yet. When your thoughts say you'll never be good enough, you say, Jesus Christ took my place at Calvary. Because of his obedience, I can receive all of the good that he deserved. And he received all of the bad that I deserve. And I'm accepted in the beloved because of Jesus Christ. Your thoughts might tell you, no one loves you. No one cares about you. You're worthless. You say this, if God sent his only son because he loved me, if God Almighty loves me, that's enough. If God Almighty loves me, the creator of heaven and earth, the creator of everything that exists, if he loves me, that is enough enough. And you know what? There are many others that love me too. And there are many others that love you too. Don't let the devil tell you that no one loves you. Don't let him make you feel that way. Your mind is where that warfare is happening. And you have to hold those thoughts accountable you have to hold them captive to Christ's obedience. All of the things that I've showed you, everything that I've pointed you to, and maybe I haven't addressed the thoughts that the devil has brought into your mind, the warfare he's tried to make in your mind. But I'm telling you, the way to address it, everything that I've addressed has been at the cross of Calvary. Everything. 
Remember, I could, I could talk to you about this motivational thing, or I could tell you about this book to read. I could talk to you a lot about it. I've, I've had a little bit of training in, in psychology and different things. I could, I could definitely talk to you and have you do some of those exercises and things. But listen, the Bible says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Can they be tools? Sure. But a tool's different than a weapon. Your mind needs to eventually, and, and I believe that eventually it will submit to the Spirit. It takes time. It takes time. It takes the Word of God. It takes the Word of God. When Satan tempted Christ, he tested him. He tested him three different times. How did Jesus respond? With the Word of God. Right back with the Word of God. Every time, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the word of, or every word that proceeds from uh, God. Every time. So when that attack comes on your mind, I'm, I'm trying to show you today that warfare that's happening, because I know some of you go through that. You face that from day to day. It happens. I have it every day that thoughts come into my mind, that things come into my mind, whatever situation it is that I'm in. And it wants to create fear and stress and worry and chaos. And God is not the author of any of those things. But he says he wants to keep your mind at perfect peace, right? Keep you at perfect peace whose minds are set on him. Set your minds on things above. All right? The Spirit of God bears witness with the truth. When we use the Word of God... That great sword. Remember that I talked about the rider on the horse having a great sword, and it was meant for destruction. The great sword that we have is not meant for destruction, except for the destruction of the strongholds that the enemy has put in your life. The sword of the Spirit. When we use the Word of God, that great sword that gives us this, this ability to combat the warfare that's going on Inside of our mind, the Holy Spirit bears witness with the truth. He will bear witness with it. And that's why before we receive communion, we, we say, I don't just say, let's just take the bread today and, and here's what we do. The Holy Spirit bears witness with the truth. What's the truth? That while Jesus, while he took that bread and he broke it, he gave thanks for it. He said, this is my body that was broken for you. That's the truth. When you receive that, you're proclaiming the truth of that, what had happened there. And the Holy Spirit bears witness with the truth. So whatever that warfare is, whatever that is that's going on in your mind, that the devil is trying to deceive you. Remember, the Bible says the word of God separates the soul and the spirit. What's happening in your mind and your will and your emotions is not the same thing that's going on in your spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you the truth. Ask him to resonate with the truth in your life. And that warfare, listen, the Bible says that the weapons are, pu are, are pulling down those strongholds, pulling them down. Pulling them down, pulling them down. Well, pastor, this is where the devil always seems to get me with this. Listen, the word of God is mighty. The sword is mighty to pull down that stronghold. And I think God is pulling some down today. I think he's removing some of those strongholds in your life. You know, strongholds don't just happen overnight. A fortress isn't built in a day. Sometimes what has taken years, the enemy has had years in your mind of building, all right? Hey, it's going to take some to pull that down. It's going to take some to pull that down. But strongholds don't happen overnight. How do I keep it from happening? It's the same idea as this. How do I keep a thought from coming into my mind, Pastor? I don't want to do that. Listen, I don't believe you can do that any more than you can stop a bird from flying over your head. But 
you can stop him from building a nest in your hair, right? Or on your head. Doesn't have as much material to work with there. I get it, but. But God wants this warfare that's going on in our mind to stop because it's going to be what it, it, it will just disable you. It will disable you from moving forward with what God wants you to do. All of the things he's placed in your spirit. Listen, if I allowed the thoughts that the devil put into my head to guide and lead what I'm doing, none of us would be here right now. Do you understand? Because the same thoughts that I just told you, you're not good enough. How can you think those things? You're not good enough. No one cares about you enough to support you. You can't do this on your own. Listen, I can't. I can't. No way. But you know what? I responded with the Word of God. Responded with the Word of God. Responded with the Word of God. Said, you know what? My mind has to be servient to the Spirit. It has to serve the Spirit. It has to. And I had to force it at times to say, listen, you need to shut up. <laughs> hey, I know it's blunt, but sometimes you just got to tell your mind, shut up a second. Because the word of God, the spirit of God is trying to speak. Hey, eventually, you know what? When someone's talking and they don't stop and you ignore them and ignore them and ignore them, right? What usually happens? They stop talking or they don't talk as loud, right? Or if you have to tell them, sometimes you just have to say, hey, take a break, right? Hey, we'll use the PC, be quiet, right? But sometimes I'm telling you, you just have to say, mind, shut up, and let the Spirit of God speak. But as you do that, I will tell you this, that the Spirit of God, its voice starts to be louder and louder and louder, and the voice of your mind starts to be less and less and less and less and less. What's happening? Those strongholds are being pulled down. They're being pulled down. They're being pulled down. And you look down the you look down the road. I've done this, and I know we're going over and we have soup today, but I've done this before. I've looked at things that I struggle with in my life, and I look today where I'm at, and I say, God, what used to be a stronghold and a struggle for me isn't even a speed bump anymore. But it didn't level off. It wasn't like... It wasn't like a, a, a nuclear bomb hit it and just leveled everything. It was pulled down. It was pulled down. Sometimes a piece at a time. Sometimes big chunks at a time. But it was pulled down. All right? And that's what God wants to do for you. That's what he wants to do for your mind. Casting down all imaginations. Holding captive every thought to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Christ.